Okay, so I think we're going to get started just because I know everybody is limited on time these days. Um, so thank you for joining us for the Seaver Center's fourth um, COVID-19 webinar. Um, we have, based on request from our last webinar, we have now uploaded the past three webinar slides as well as the video uh, presentation. So if you go to the Seaver Autism Center's website, um, all of the past webinars are on there. Um, I can't reiterate enough. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. We want this to be as informative and resourceful, uh, positive resource as possible. Um, so we do encourage if there are specific topics that you're struggling with at home or feel like a webinar would be really helpful, please use the chat feature on Zoom and type in ideas. Um, this webinar topic came from a parent's um, suggestion and we were so happy that a parent made us aware of this issue and we can kind of address it today. So today's webinar is going to focus on wearing face masks um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, strategies to overcome sensory issues. So obviously we are all aware that New York is now requiring individuals to wear face masks when we are not able to social practice social distancing um, and we recognize that for children there might be issues wearing face masks themselves but also anxiety around seeing others wear face masks um, so we are hoping that today's webinar gives some strategies um, because we are discussing sensory issues and doctors wife and myself are both clinical psychologists this is definitely a little bit outside of our area of expertise. So we are excited to have a guest presenter today, um, Andy Sachs. Um, so Andy Sachs is gonna be doing most of the talking today. Um, she is a New York City-based pediatric occupational therapist, um, working both in private practice for children ages two and up, and the Cook School, and the Institute's Academy program where she works specifically with high school age students. She provides evaluations and specialized treatment for individuals with fine motor delays, visual motor difficulties, and a variety of sensory integration deficits. She also specializes in addressing functional life skills across the lifespan with a focus on helping individuals succeed in their home and community settings. And is a certified provider for the listening program and is trained in the use of handwriting without tears for all ages. She received her master's of science degree in occupational therapy from Boston University, University Sargent College. Um, so we are very excited uh, that uh, Andy is able to join us and kind of share all of her knowledge. Again, so the focus of today's session Um, we are going to do brief introductions, um, and then uh, Andy is going to talk about what is sensory processing, face mask, and sensory processing difficulties, um, some sensory strategies, and then uh, Dr. Zweifak and myself will kind of talk about some behavioral strategies. And as the format for all of our webinars, um, we are going to have like 20 minutes of a presentation, and then a lot of the time is going to be spent answering your questions. Um, so on today's call, there are two clinical psychologists and an OT. Um, and again, we are happy to focus the Q&A on topics covered during today's, but if there are pressing issues or concerns that you're having, um, feel free to ask that as well. Um, so my name is Michelle Gorenstein. I'm a clinical psychologist and director of outreach for the Seaver Center. Jesse? Hi, I'm Jessica Zweifek. I'm also a clinical psychologist at the Seaver Center. Okay, and I, I already gave um, Andy Sachs's presentation. Hi, <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're going to be hearing from her right now. Perfect. Thank you for that. So I wanted to jump right in by giving a brief overview of sensory processing since the introduction of a face mask for anyone will have an impact on our sensory processing system. So sensory processing is how our nervous system receives input from the senses and turns it into an appropriate motor and behavioral response. So meaning that for most people, 
we experience things throughout the day, like our noises, colors, movement, touch, literally anything. And our body knows how to interpret and then respond to that sensory information. For others, although they experience the same things as us, the way their body perceives or receives that sensory input and then responds to that information is completely different, which can have an impact on how they interact with their work, excuse me, with their world. So you can imagine a person with sensory processing disorder might demonstrate some sort of maladaptive response to basic sensory input because of how their body is perceiving the input or processing it. A person with sensory processing disorder might demonstrate an over-responsive response, meaning that they experience too much sensory information filling up their system at once, sending them into like a sort of overload, making those individuals want to avoid sensory input altogether. So we call those our sensory avoiders. And then on the other end, we have people who might experience an under-responsive response, meaning that they require more sensory stimulation in order to feel something or like fill their tank. So those are individuals who might wanna avoid, sorry, might wanna seek out additional sensory input in order to feel something. So we call those people our sensory seekers. So for sensory processing, it's important to remember that it is a spectrum. And since we experience senses in so many different ways, a person might be over-responsive to one type of sensory input but yet under responsive to another, or kind of in this like fluctuating state back and forth throughout the day, which as you can imagine would be extremely taxing. So this is especially important to consider when introducing an individual with sensory issues to wearing a face mask. So moving on. So when we introduce an individual with sensory processing disorder to wearing a face mask, there are a few different sensory components that we have to consider. First and foremost, our ability to breathe is impacted, which is our body's natural way of regulating our nervous system. So this system is most important to consider for individuals with sensory processing disorder because it could elicit a fight or flight response. So reminding individuals that they are still able to breathe normally, even with their mouth and their nose covered can be really helpful. And I picture like that airplane announcement where like the thing drops down, but really giving them that reassurance. We also have to consider that the addition of wearing a face mask can impact their, a person's tactile sense, their sense of touch, just by nature of something being on their face, which for most people is a very sensitive area. Also their olfactory sense, so their sense of smell is impacted, as well as their proprioceptive sense, which helps a person figure out where their body is in space. And then two other areas that are important to consider for this population could also be emotional regulation since our facial features are covered or covered for them and for the person they're looking at, which is a big part of communication and expression. And then also impulsivity, specifically for face masks, I can see this being a problem if an individual just can't control touching their face or adjusting their mask, which is kind of the point in wearing a face mask to begin with. So when and if possible, and again, I wanna stress that if possible, I like to allow individuals to express what they like or dislike about wearing face masks. And I find this is a good first step because it can give a lot of insight into what areas might be bothering them. So like that breathing aspect or that sense of smell. And then I realize that it's not always possible to do this. So we, in my next slide, I'll go over some strategies of ways if it can't be communicated to us that we can kind of pick up on along the way. So now we'll go over the strategies. I like to always start by having a caregiver, a parent, a sibling, anyone in the household really, wear a face mask as a model. So the hope is that a child or individual would develop some sort of curiosity towards it. And then it would also help them and make it feel less taboo or new. Um, I like to also have children play with the face mask. So putting it on a favorite toy or a doll or a character, just really trying to expose them to it in as many ways as possible. I like to advise practicing wearing a face mask at home and increasing the amount of time that it's worn each day. And I recommend introducing this at times where a child might be playing a game or watching a TV show in order to pair it with something motivating or engaging, kind of as a way to like distract them. So it shouldn't just be like the mask wearing time since even when any of us are wearing masks outside of the house, we're usually occupied by other activities like going for a walk or grocery shopping or whatever it might be. My next strategy is 
that children should be included in the process of designing, coloring, and even putting on their own face mask. So this is kind of bringing us back to if a child can't communicate what they like or dislike, we might get a lot of insight even before the mask is being worn into how a child might feel by interacting with the face mask. And then I want to highlight the putting on piece. I, as an OT, am a firm believer in letting all individuals try things on their own first before doing it for them. I find that I just get a lot more buy-in that way. So even if they're unable to do the task completely by like putting it behind their ears or securing it behind their head, um, allowing them to try part of the task and then building it up with hand over hand strategies or you do part and then they do the next part. We just want them to be an active participant. And I know this is a lot easier to do when we're just practicing in the home, but giving them that time so it's not just when they're running out the door that they're trying to put the mask on themselves. And then from a sensory aspect, exploring different fabrics. So choosing soft, breathable, non itchy fabrics and fabrics with fewer seams. Um, just as a note, homemade cotton tends to be a lot more breathable than a store bought mask and also more breathable than like the denim or terry cloth fabric that a lot of people are using as homemade masks. And again, the CDC right now is recommending that if you are making a homemade cotton mask that it should have at least two layers. So keeping that in mind. Um, and then I would also play around with maybe just omitting the internal filters that people are using. I know a lot of individuals are using coffee filters, which while they're really good for filtering out particles, they tend to be harder to breathe through. Breathe through. So kind of just focusing on that coverage and going from there. And then my last point, which I think can be the most fun to play around with, is figuring out different coverings for the ear. So I would definitely recommend avoiding any rubber band or elastic or anything that's tight and puts pressure behind the ears. I've seen people using shoelaces that go in the back of the head and I'll show you on my next slide, different ways to secure the mask to the side of a headband or a hat. Um, so those strategies are useful because it actually helps distribute the pressure versus having it pinpointed behind the head, which can be a lot easier to tolerate. And then I would also be flexible with sizing of the mask, perhaps using an adult size mask on a smaller child. If it's feeling a little bit too claustrophobic with it being too tight to their face, an adult size mask could allow for more room to breathe and speak as long as it's still covering their facial features. So these pictures, um, this slide just shows some of the adaptations of how to tie the mask differently. Again, the target being to alleviate that pressure around the ears and distribute the tactile sensation a bit more, making it just like a little bit easier to tolerate. And then the strategy of using the button on the headband I mentioned, I've also seen being done on baseball hats or any type of head covering. And it can be fastened on with a button, a snap, or even a safety pin, I would imagine would hold it in place. And then my favorite one, an OT in an online group figured out a way to use a monkey from a barrel of monkeys to secure the face mask behind the head. And that is it right now, although I'm sure in the coming weeks we'll just see a ton more of creative solutions emerging. And that is it. Great, thank you so much, Andy. Um, so now Dr. Gornstein and I will just cover a couple of behavioral strategies and ways to encourage all these great um, sort of sensory strategies, sensory focused strategies that Andy shared with everyone. Um, so these, this first set of behavioral strategies, if you tuned into some of our previous webinars are things that we covered in other contexts before. So these are just ways that we can think about our language and using visuals to encourage the use of face masks. So first of all, the transitional warning. So we really want to let kids know what to expect in all aspects of our day, including when it's time to put on a face mask, which is sort of a far and a new experience for most people. So when it's almost time to get going, it's great to say in five minutes or in two minutes, we'll go outside. Remember, we'll put on our jackets and our masks. So um, giving the warning, it sort of normalizes the process for kids and also gives them a little bit of time to think about the fact that they're gonna be putting it on soon. We also wanna offer choices whenever possible. So like Andy was saying, great to give choices when you're picking masks out. If you happen to have more than one mask or more than one way to attach your mask, like she was saying with all these ad great adaptive ways of putting them on, you can ask the child, would you like to wear your orange or your blue mask today? 
there's the expectation either way that they're wearing a mask, but it gives them a little bit of a sense of ownership and control. Um, for kids who are less verbal, you can also hold the two options up and let them make a choice. We also want to think about rewards and sort of structuring our language to include a preferred activity as what feels like a reward for them. So usually the reason we'll be putting on a mask is that we're going outside. So reminding kids that when they put their mask on, they get to go outside to explore, they get to ride on their scooter, whatever it is that you're doing, try to just structure the language to make it a little more appealing to put on a mask. Um, finally, we think about the use of visuals to support all of our routines, including put a, putting on a mask. So we want to think about social stories, which we'll have some examples of on the next slide. Um, and that will really give us, like Andy was saying, it's great to be a model of wearing a mask in your home. Reading social stories is another way to model wearing masks where we're seeing cartoons or pictures of other children wearing them to sort of expose our kids to the idea of it. Um, the, the examples that will be attached here in this webinar use really simple language that include steps and also simple language for the reason that we're putting masks on that hopefully most of our kids can understand. And even if they don't understand the ins and outs of everything, being exposed to these images of people wearing masks to do preferred activities is a really, really helpful way to allow children to know and adults to know what to expect when they get outside and when they do put the mask on. The other thing we can do is use a very simple visual schedule, possibly to post it by the door if it's a part of your process anyway to you know, show when, when it's time to get ready to go outside. We put on our jacket, we put on our sneakers, and now we also put on our mask. So, you know, the, the example on the right side of the slide here is just a simple first, next, last. So first jacket, next mask, last scooting, the preferred activity at the end, hopefully for each child to make it a little bit more reinforcing and enjoyable. And here on this slide are these examples of um, social stories, so wearing a mask and also seeing others wear masks, which can be a little bit jarring for kids and adults these days um, to expose us to the idea that this is going to be something that we're seeing around us, whether we're going on a walk, going to the grocery store, possibly even eventually reintegrating into the classroom. We don't really know exactly what things will look like, but likely there will be masks when there are larger groups of people around for some time. Um, so these uh, all have links here and they are, they're printable. So if you happen to have a printer at home, you can go to these links and print out these examples of social stories. Um, I know that this one in the middle is definitely a printable. The others may be um, videos, which you can also watch with, with your families of helpful tips and um, going through steps of the reasons we're wearing them and how to put them on as well. So the two, the wearing a mask social story and the one in the middle are printable. The we wear a mask is a YouTube video. So that would be a good option if you don't have a printer um, that you could just watch. It's a short cartoon clip in the form of a social story. So we're gonna end today just um, on some behavioral strategies. So these would be more for if your child is or still having difficulty after you explore sensory, after you create some visuals. And these are strategies often used in ABA therapy um, and were mentioned briefly. But the idea is that if this is a real challenge to get your child to wear the mask, um, you're gonna to wanna to introduce the individual to wearing the mask and pair it with frequent reinforcement. So that reinforcement might be a sickle, simple tickle or a hug. If it's a real challenge, it might be something more tangible. Um, and this is where you'd wanna think about what the child uses during the school or during their ABA therapy to get them to engage in the, in the requested activity. Um, and you're gonna start off very simply. And again, I didn't create a behavioral um, schedule because for every individual where they start might be different as well as the frequency that they're able to move steps um, but obviously the most basic would be showing the child the mask or having the mask just even out on a table 
um, without the child becoming agitated or engaging in a negative behavior. Um, so putting the package comes, having the package out with the mask open on the kitchen table just for the child to be seeing and exploring in some way or whatever way the child explores. Um, maybe the next thing would be having the child touch the mask or having the child touch the mask to their face. Then it might be having the child explore putting on the mask in whatever way they want. Um, and then it might be having the child wear a mask for a minute while watching their favorite movie and slowly extending the time. Then maybe it's having the child put on the mask while they're not engaged in a preferred activity. Um, but again, slowly building those steps with the goal of having the child wear the mask su successfully when they're outdoors. Um, and again, that's something that if your child is working with an ABA therapist, an occupational therapist, um, you can set those steps based on your child's behavior, based on your child's sensory um, profile, and based on your child's language. Um, so pairing is the idea that you pair the not so preferred activity, the wearing the mask with a preferred kind of reinforcement. Chaining is the idea that you're gonna take very small baby steps towards wearing the mask. And as I mentioned, the steps are gonna vary significantly by the individual. And again, also vary significantly at the rate that you move from step to step. So again, you're not gonna to move to the next step if the individual's still really struggling or engaging in maladaptive behaviors at kind of the more basic step. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about behavioral strategies that are gonna be used with the sensory strategies and the visual supports. Um, the last slide, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, again, this is not specifically to autism, but I think they put out a lot of guidelines that are helpful for all children, individuals that are struggling with wearing a mask, and I put that link as well. Um, it's, a very, it's a very brief article, but gives a lot of the strategies that we talked about and some additional resources. Um, so thank you for tuning in to the webinar. I was informed that unfortunately at this point, our videos are not up. Hopefully they will be up next week, but all four webinar slides are up on the Seaver Autism Center's website. Um, so if today's your first day joining and you want to learn about what things we talked about the past three weeks or want to get the um, website titles and click-throughs, you can kind of explore on our website. We have all that information. Um, so now we would love to open it up to questions either regarding this webinar or other issues that you're having or more importantly, we would also love to hear your ideas for future webinars and how we can be a resource for you during this kind of challenging time. Hello? Hi. Hi. <clears throat> um, it's Alice Marks again. I, this is the fourth one. I, this is incredible. I, 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 I'm so in awe of all of you. And this was the most useful one from my vantage point. Not that the others weren't, but could you just repeat the, the website for me where I get, uh, where I can get the slides and all the other information? I would genuinely appreciate it. Um, so if you go to just the general Seaver Autism Center's website, mm -hmm. there is a click through on COVID-19 resources mm -hmm. and all of our webinar slides are there as well as other resources and links that we've um, compiled to help families. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to try to paste that into the chat now as well, Alice. Yes, Audrey just posted. Oh, she did. You're very quick, Audrey. Thank oh, you. How do I get off this? I don't know. So if you go into the chat feature, there's a, the link is right there. Okay. Oh, God. 
So the chat feature will be at the bottom of the screen. Uh -huh. um, there's a little like thought bubble that says yeah. chat. If you open it up, you'll be able to see that resource. Thank um, you so much. Thank you. And Debbie just asked, how do you help children with autism who are three, four, and five? Um, Debbie, could you clarify, is this just in general or is this specific to wearing the mask? Hi, this is Debbie. Okay. I am a self-contained autistic teacher. I teach three, four, and five-year-olds. I have 18 children. They have so many sensory needs, it's, you have to watch every single thing they do. I want, would like to provide some kind of information for parents because I know they have to go out of the house at some point with their children, but my children don't like anything on their face. They don't like anything on their heads. They, they don't like to be, you know, they have to get used to us even coming near them to, or they'll approach us to, for a hug or to sit with us. So the thought of putting a face mask on any of them would be, I could just see them ripping it off and tearing it apart. Suggestions to give to the parents, because I know that they're all dealing with that now. I'm happy to jump in here. So, I mean, I totally get that. I've been there. I will be there with you working on those types of, um, in that situation. Um, the same strategies that I think I mentioned just starting from the beginning of like exposing, hopefully parents can start this exposure before they're having to wear it at school. And I mean, we, nobody knows the timeline right now. So who knows if that's even going to be a thing. Um, but hopefully they're starting that exposure early enough that they're developing some sort of curiosity and some ownership over it. I know at that at such a young age that impulsivity really comes um, creeping through. And I, I feel like right now there's just so much unknown with like what what our environments will look like once we are out of the house. Yeah. Um, but it's just going to be a trial and error. And I, it's like an answer without being an answer. But it's just I think it's going to depend on so many different factors. Maybe. I mean, I would love to be the one to create a, a face mask that's not really a, a sensory type stimulator that it just somehow blocks everything. Um, but I think before we even get to that point, who knows what like group sizes will be. Um, right. Yeah. Because I, I do use the first then with them, with the preferred, right. the non-preferred and then to go to preferred. I use it every day with right, them. Yeah. Um, so it's like they can handle two steps. I don't know if they can handle a three-step thing. First, we're going to do this. Next, we're going to do this. Last, we're going to do this. They're basically at the one-step stage. Mm -hmm. well, first, you're going to do this. Then you can have your Legos. You know, or first, you're going to put your face mask on. Then you can go play outside. I don't know how three steps will work with them. I'm also wondering in terms of creating like a social, like a personalized social story, like maybe with a picture of you wearing the face mask. Okay um that can, you could send out to the students and um obviously the five-year-olds if they have more receptive language there could be some words or it could just be for the three-year-olds all in pictures um that would be one strategy i know i have a three-year-old at home and i found on etsy uh somebody who's making face masks for themselves as well as dolls um, so I bought my daughter that so she can practice using the face mask on a doll and it's the doll size and then she'll have a matching one um, but talking to parents about including their children in the process of picking face mask and also making sure that when you are having parents look at face masks that you're looking at as um, discussed like the the fabrics um, just because I, my sense is that some of these handmade fabrics are going to be pretty tough on the skin versus some of the um, companies that used to make children's clothes that have now opened the factories to face masks. Those are going to be the softer fabrics. Okay. Um, but making the, I'm sure the face mask has their child's favorite character or their child's favorite color um, will be important. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions related? Hello? 
Um, hello. I'm, yes, hi. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I haven't used Zoom before. Um, I have a question about the, the face shields uh, that I've seen some people using. Um, I think that would be less um, irritating to some of our kids, but I'm wondering at their, if you know anything about how effective they would be. Um, they you know, leave a lot more room in front of the face and the children would still be able to see, um, but it seems like a wide opening around the chin area. So um, do you guys know anything about whether those are effective at all by themselves? I don't know much. The way I've seen the face shields used is in addition to a surgical mask or some other kind of covering. Um, so I don't know that they're being used in isolation. Uh, unless, but you may know more though than, than what I've read and seen. But my understanding is that those are used by medical professional, professionals in addition to a regular mask. Okay. Yeah, and again, I think the situation is constantly evolving. Um, right. So, at this point the CDC in New York is like the fabric mask, but I mean, assuming that there's going to be a lot of advocacy done by autism groups, maybe there that would be a modification that can be made in the future. Um, sure. I read a story of a mom who needed to go to something within the paper who wore like a um, Buzz Lightyear. Um, because they, this was at the beginning of the outbreak before everybody had fabric mask and she wanted to protect herself. Um, so I, but I think with the information we have, the recommendation is for the fabric mask covering the nose to the bottom of the face. Great. Okay. Thank you. Well. Any other questions? It could also be related to another issue around COVID-19 and autism. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I joined this late and I, and I don't know if you covered this. I, I apologize. I was meaning to get on at 12 and then things happened. Um, but I just wanted to ask if it has been covered, I apologize. Um, for my son, who's 24, um, he's using it, but because he's with staff in the car and they're not related and in our household, he needs to have the face mask on in the car. But with me being his mom, he doesn't. But, and, and that's one example of, sort of there's not one rule which if there was one rule would be easier but there's right. two or three rules and i'm just wondering how you would suggest dealing with that it's so complicated sometimes you need to wear it in the car sometimes you don't so i've just been wearing it all the time in the car but then the gloves sometimes you you know do you wear the i find it as a, a typical learner i find it okay i'm wearing my gloves inside of a restaurant I mean, not in a restaurant, I'm sorry, inside of a store, and then I'm taking them off, but where am I putting them? Because now they got the store COVID on them, all these different mutations of rules. Right. Well, what you mentioned- I know it's not is, a sensory issue, but it, it's- No, it's this is out. a really important, important question, and it can come up in a lot of different contexts for our for it all all individuals these days with having rules for things. I think you mentioned, you know, you know what your son can handle. So I think you mentioned one great strategy. If if you think that having too many different rules is more complicated and it's just easier to say we wear it when we're in the car, then it it may be worth doing that for this period of time. Um, the other way to do it is possibly to have a, a sort of individual social stories or it doesn't have to be a whole story it can be one sort of visual prompt that shows when you go in the car with this therapist or this staff person and that's about to happen you have to put on the mask and just remind him of that before you get in the car um and then when it's just the two of you you can have a picture remember this picture of mom and here's you without a mask on and that's what we're going to okay, do that's, in yeah. five minutes um, to try to just simplify things for yourselves a little bit. But you're right, it's 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 a lot easier said than done to sort of have 
one visual schedule by the door that works for, for every scenario. So any way that you can do it to simplify it for you and your son is, is what we would recommend for sure. And then I like the idea with the picture next to face mask or no face mask. Yeah. And then for, for the gloves, I mean, I think this is something that everybody is struggling with. Um, <laughs> of having like a visual picture of like the steps and maybe it's as soon as you walk into the house, there's a garbage where that's where the gloves go. Um, and it wouldn't just be for your son, it would be for everybody in the house to follow. Like, okay, so we get home, we unpack the thing, we now throw the gloves away, and this is where the gloves go. I'm finding it hard to throw away gloves because I only have a couple pair, to yeah. tell you the truth, right. which also complicates it. I don't know where people are getting them. Right. I've heard of people um, putting them... I don't know much about the infection control aspect. This is really just what people are, I've heard are doing, just putting them in a Ziploc by the door, not touching it again for X number of hours and then reusing for things like masks and gloves if you don't, if you aren't able to. Though I know the CDC, I think is saying to wash these masks ever, after every use. Is that right, Michelle? That's what it, so that's a hard, right. uh, that is a hard situation. If you're wearing like mittens or something, I mean, I, I think right. we're getting creative, having like a laundry basket where after you do it, then you put like the mittens or gardening gloves or whatever you've worn, and that means that they're going to get washed. Um, right. So I, I think everyone's family is going to kind of have to navigate it on their own, depending on their resources, depending on how often they're going out, what's feasible. Um, but I think the strategies of using visuals breaking things down, having schedules um, is going to be consistent. Thank you. For sure. Okay, that one is a... Oh, someone just wrote, you can order the gloves from Walmart. Walmart, okay. Yeah, Thank I've you. heard they're getting more stock of things at Target as well. Someone said um, Menards or Maynards. Menards. I no, also wanted to jump on that the whole point of wearing gloves, to my knowledge, is to avoid spreading it by touching your face or other surfaces. So also just frequent hand washing. So even if you go out without gloves on, just making sure that you're not touching your face or the face mask, um, and then just washing your hands for 20 seconds. I think that's, I think that's my, my daughter is a nurse, and she told me, and I've got hand sanitizer here at home, and she said, Mom, and she works in an intensive care unit right now in Chicago wow. with COVID every day. So what it, she is telling me is wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Because if you wear the gloves, that what you're doing is if you're at the grocery store, you're basically cross-contaminating if you go touch the fruits and vegetables. And then you go and touch a, a box of crackers that you're going to go buy and everything. So she said, basically, don't wear the gloves. Just make sure you have something that your hands are washed at all times or wiped off like the minute you get out of the store. Yes. Clean your hands off before you get in the car and get rid of gloves or anything else like that. Don't even take them home if you're wearing gloves. Just get rid of them as you're walking out of the store. Have them in no environment near your house. And that's from an intensive care nurse. So, yeah, I'm almost thinking no gloves is better than trying to navigate all that. It no is. gloves, just wash your hands. Right. That's how I started. But then I yeah. saw everybody with gloves and I thought, uh oh. But but mm. the cross contamination is going on with that. So it's like you're touching everything. So absolutely you have to have a mask. This is per her and all the doctors that she work with. You have to have a mask, but the gloves just constantly wash your hands and make sure that they're sanitized and they're clean. And again, I think when we're thinking about having individuals on the spectrum wear things. The mask is now like a CPC requirement, or especially in New York. Um, the gloves are not, so kind of in your battles. And if the gloves are going to be sensory overload um, and create issues, I wouldn't focus on that. And again, as everyone mentioned, doing the hand washing is the critical thing. Um, so somebody just wrote, I have an older brother with him and he's giving us a hard time wearing the mask. Any suggestions to get him to wear the mask when going out? Do you want to kind of give an overview of what the strategies you had mentioned earlier? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, starting with just understanding like what their baseline for sensory processing. So what what is it that bothers him about wearing a mask? If it's that unfamiliarity, just exposing him to it more in the house with you or somebody, another caregiver just wearing it around him. Um, and then we also talked about including individuals in the like process of creating a mask. So maybe it's just that he's not motivated. So making it a mask that's meaningful to him. And even if it's a disposable mask or a homemade mask, there are ways to just like add stickers or color on it without it like ruining the integrity of the mask. Um, and then also just like playing around with the, the way that it's on his head. So maybe if, I don't know if he's able to express what he likes or dislikes about the way that it might feel on his face. Um, but I mean, as much as possible, trying to gauge with him, like what he likes. And obviously you could see that if he is nonverbal and unable to express what but I would certainly start by having him practice wearing it in the home before even doing it for going outside. And we were also, and give frequent reinforcement mm -hmm. and kind of being mindful of like how long he's able to have the mask trying to extend that time. Um, and I think Andy mentions a really great strategy, um, having him first practice wearing the mask while engaging in a preferred activity so that he's distracted and not focused on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I just noticed Jordan wrote, he's uncomfortable wearing it. We have to keep him home because he won't wear it. So I wonder if even showing him pictures, I know like now if you go outside, everyone on the street is wearing it. So maybe just showing him that like everyone in the community is doing the same thing. And that's the way that if he wants to go out, that he would have to be able to, to have the mask on in order to do so. And some of the social stories do give some simple explanations for the reason why we're, simple language for why we're doing this now. So it's possible just exposing him, in addition to exposing him to wearing it at home, to the reasons, to seeing other people wearing it, that that could hopefully um, give you a little bit more support in supporting your brother. And lastly, I would say if there's like someplace really motivating or something really motivating that he wants to do when he goes out, making that one of the first things so that way it's okay, we're wearing the mask so you can do X. Um, and that might be going to a park, it might be going to a favorite location just to kind of sit for a few minutes. Um, but getting him to be able to see it like wearing the mask and this positive experience. Any other questions? Or again, if anyone has ideas for future webinars, feel free to type in. Um, this topic came from a parent's suggestion last week. Are there going to be any other webinars? Um, from Seaver Autism Center within the next few weeks? So at this point, as long as there are people coming, we plan on having them every Thursday um, at 12. Um, so last week we got this topic and we put this together. Um, so we are planning on having another one next Thursday. Um, and we were looking for you to kind of give suggestions for topics. Um, we again want this to be, we understand that everybody's time is very limited. Uh, being a parent, uh, therapist, teacher, if you worked outside of the home, continuing to manage that. Um, so we want these 45 minutes together to be meaningful. So that's kind of why we were looking for your feedback to kind of guide the topics. Could you possibly, um or would you possibly think about doing one on, because I've got children who have, they're all autistic, but the fact of the matter is some have materials at home, some do not have materials at home. And when we have to do this remote learning and give suggestions to the parents, I'm thinking of every modification that I can, but it has to be a modification that's safe for them, where instead of shaving cream on a cookie sheet, do whipped cream because they can eat the whipped cream. And, you know, they'll get sick if they eat the shaving cream and things like that, or so that, um, that financially that they can afford it and not have to go and go out and buy things for the children right now. So if any kind of things like that for ideas for remote teaching for autistic children who are three, four, and five years old who 
They don't really get what's going on. They don't understand why they can't go outside and play. They don't understand why they just basically are locked in their house. And the most they could do is go in the car and go to a drive through at McDonald's. They don't understand it. So if you go to the Saver Autism Center's website, um, which is in the chat, the direct link, um, we have put together resources. So we've put together their general social stories that um, are available for free, help families and children understand or explain uh, COVID uh, language. Okay. Um, we also have a list of ways to practice social skills at home using materials that would be at home or no materials at all. Um, okay. We also have links to several free online activities that could be good for individuals on the spectrum. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, well. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I missed a good chunk of this uh, seminar. Is it going to be recorded? So it is recorded. Hopefully, it should be on our, our website along with the past three webinars by next week, we're hoping. These slides are all on our website as of now. Um, so you will have access to the slides from this webinar as well as the past three webinars if you visit the Seaver Autism Center's website. Um, and if you scroll through the chat, you can find the direct link um, to all of our COVID-19 resources. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, well, thank you, everyone. Um, if you do think of any ideas or just didn't want to share it with the group, you can always email Audrey or Barry. Their email addresses are on the last slide. Um, and we hope to see you all next week. Thank you yeah. again for joining thank us. Thank you for your time and a special thank you to Andy Sachs for yeah, joining us. That was really so informative. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Ah!